right. Good to see everybody here tonight. I'm glad your sins are gone. Amen. That's what she was playing, in case you didn't know that. And uh, praise God, my sins are gone. All right, take your Bible this evening. Go to 1 Peter chapter 3, please. 1 Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3, two verses we want to look at this evening, verses 8 and 9. Verses 8 and 9 of 1 Peter chapter 3, where the Bible says, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. Now, Father, add your blessing to the reading of our word here tonight, and Lord, as we uh, study these verses together this evening, that you'll open our understanding as we look into your word, Holy Spirit of God, that you'll be the teacher, and that, Lord, you will give enlightenment to us and illumination to your word, that we'll understand the word and we'll live the Bible we learned this evening. So have your way in these next few moments as we study your word together. Help us to study to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And I prayed in Jesus' name, amen. Now, it's interesting, as Peter comes to chapter 3 and verse number 8, he says the word finally, and uh, you understand he's only halfway through the book, so sometimes when the preacher says finally, that doesn't mean he's ready to finish, it just means we're halfway through the message. And um, Peter goes on for another two and a half chapters. Um, but he's giving us some things here that we ought to be as believers, all right? And uh, this is dealing especially with our treatment one of another. And it's interesting the context that he's dealing with this. Don't, don't just, we, we just read verse 8 and 9, but don't miss the first seven verses. The first seven verses, he says in verse 1, Likewise ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they may also without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. I'm talking about how a, an, a, a saved wife can win her unsaved husband to Christ and how that can come about. And he talks about how it's not by what you're saying or you preaching to him, but it's your hidden man of the heart. Verse 4, that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. And then he talks about Sarah. And then in verse 7, he says, Likewise ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of God, that your prayers be not hindered. So he's talking to wives and he's talking to husbands. And then he says, finally, be ye all of one mind, have compassion one of another, in the verses we read tonight. So in the context, it's how a husband treats his wife and how a wife treats her husband. In other words, it's it, these one another sometimes of the Bible and things we ought to be, they, they're things that we need to be at home, not just things we need to be at church are things we need to be towards others. Sometimes uh, people put on their best Christianity when they're away from home. But the Bible always puts the emphasis that your best Christianity ought to be at home. And that's where, that's where the rubber meets the road. And that's where Peter deals with. And so keep this context uh, as we go through these verses tonight. Now, the first thing he says here is that we are to be ye all of one mind. Be of one mind. Uh, we have that uh, reiterated for us uh, over and over again uh, throughout the New Testament. In Romans chapter 12 and verse number 16, the Bible says, Be of the same mind one toward another. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, 2 Corinthians 13, verse number 11, again, uh, Paul admonishes them, Family, brethren, farewell, be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace. Look in the book of Philippians with me, would you? Philippians chapter 1, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith 
of the gospel. Now, over and over again, it's, it, the Bible reiterates, we're to be of the same mind. We're to have one mind. What's that mean? It means your opinion and my opinion doesn't matter. What I think, what you think, doesn't really matter. Uh, what, what, what matters is, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. It's that we have the mind of Christ, and that we follow the Word of God. You have to understand, when before you were saved, before you were saved as an unsaved person, our minds were at enmity against God. Our mind was against Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Colossians 1.21 that we were alienated in our minds from God. We were separated from Him. And, and He reconciles us back to Him from an evil mind. Romans 8.7, the carnal mind is enmity against God. It's against God. It's not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. I don't, I don't expect lost people to obey the Bible. I don't expect lost people to understand the Bible. Uh, they're, they're, they're reading mail that wasn't addressed to them. And uh, it's not for them to be able to... They, they, it, won't make, it won't make any sense to an unsaved mind. They, it, it won't be... They, they won't understand it. And so it's, uh, it, it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So how, do we, how does that mind, and when we're saved and we receive Christ our Savior, how does that mind then get changed? Well, Romans 12 and verse 1 and 2. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Look at that with me, will you please? Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Most of you are familiar with them. But it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. How does that happen? By the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. But, listen... The unrenewed mind is not concerned with the good, acceptable, or perfect will of God. It's not concerned with the will of God at all. Uh, that's not the mindset of someone who doesn't know God. And so, when the Bible says renew your mind, renew means to renovate. It means to restore to a former state or to a good state after decay or deprivation. So, our, our, listen, when man sinned, we're all born with a decayed mind. But God's able to renew that mind. And, and He's giving us, uh, I think we, He's able to restore the mind that wants to please God, the mind that wants to serve God, the mind that wants to submit to God, the mind that desires the things of God. And God's able to do that, and that's a renewal process. And that process takes place by the Word of God. What God uses to reprogram us and renew us back to our state where we'll want to please Him is His Word. That's it. Without the Word of God, your mind will never be renewed. I was, it, it's funny, just today a uh, Sword of the Lord newspaper came and, and they had an article in there, a survey that was done among what they call evangelical Christians. Evangelical simply meaning that they're in a church that preaches the gospel that at least to be a church that would tell you you have to be saved by grace through faith. And they are just alarmed at the results from this latest poll they took. And the alarming fact is, is uh, 30, I think it was over 33% of the respondents uh, were favorable towards Marxist principles. Over 40% of them were, were very uh, lenient, uh, towards secular humanism and some of their tenets. And you think, and, and they're just amazed, saying, how can this happen? What is happening? Well, I'll tell you what's happening. Uh, people are getting so little Bible, and they're getting so much world, it's influenced what they believe. It's influenced what they, what they learn. And, and you're not going to get it. Listen, you're not going to come give God one hour on Sunday and give the other 167 to the world and think you're, you're going to have the victory. Uh, you're going to be influenced. You're going to be conformed to the world. Okay? You begin to get, get pressed into their mold. And that's, why, and that's why you've seen through the years, you've seen how America, I think when they first come out with abortion, 
uh, there was 80 some percent of Americans against it. Now that pendulum has swung and now for the first time, this last time, they were more in favor of it than were against it. See, what has happened in 30 years? See, we, we've gotten away from Bible teaching, Bible preaching, and, and, and understanding that this, this is how we're of one mind. This is how we're all st we all stay on the same page. And, and, and that, that, you say, well, you're, you're, you're just reprogramming people. Yeah, God does that with the Bible. He reprograms my brain to think as He wants me to think. And so it's not, our, listen, we are of one mind because we're people of one book. You're not, you're not of one mind if you don't have one authority. And our authority is God's Word. And so we're all people of one book. And our cry is never reason, our cry is revelation. It's what God says. Not I think, not it seems to me, but what does thus saith the Lord? What does God say? That's what we're about. So that's the only way, church, that we can be of one mind. Okay? Say, so you all, all you think alike. Well, we think alike. We believe alike because we're people of this book. And we want to do what God says. Okay? So be of one mind. Then, back in 1 Peter chapter 3, notice he says, Be of one mind, having compassion one of another. So the second B is be compassionate. This is a compound word, of course, come meaning with, and passion meaning feeling, or with feeling. So it means to feel with, or to feel together. All right? So having the same mind means we have common thinking, but now we're to have common feeling also. Having one mind and one heart. Okay? And it's, it's let's weep with those that weep, let's rejoice with those that rejoice. Okay? That's compassion. And when uh, compassion is when one member of the body hurts, we all hurt. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 12. That's the way your body is. You ever, you ever been pounding a nail in the wall and you hit the wrong nail? What do you do? You do one of two things. Either this goes here or this goes here. Ah. But other members of the body came to the rescue of the one that's hurting. See, and you want to give aid to that. And so that's the way it is and the way it should be with believers. You know, it's the, it's the uh, Indian saying, you know, don't, don't be too hard on somebody until you walk a mile in their moccasins. All right? Uh, a lot of times we're so quick to come up with an opinion, so quick to know what somebody ought to do, but we're not, we're not privy to all the information that they're privy to. We don't know all the facts that they, and so it's easy for us to stand back and say, well, they ought to do this. But we don't know all the details of what goes into that decision. And so be careful about that. And be of compassion. Uh, you know, the Good Samaritan, in the story of the Good Samaritan, remember the priest and the Levite passed by? The Bible says the Good Samaritan had compassion on him and went to him compassion for him he felt for him and then he went with him and to him let me illustrate this i read this story uh this week it uh the a preacher i think was relating this story he said friends were uh down at a, our business having their car worked on and he said we while we were there lunchtime came around and the husband suggested we go to a diner a few doors away to try the blue plate special he said we walked down the street to the restaurant and ate and when we walked back i felt my foot come down on something that didn't feel like sidewalk. I lifted up my foot and there was a tiny sparrow on the concrete. I hadn't squashed him because I'd lifted my foot up in time. He was looking a bit bewildered and obviously couldn't fly. Well, I said something to my friends and the wife and I kept on walking. But we looked back and the husband was not with us. He had stopped to pick up that little sparrow and had nursed it and taken it over to some high shrubs next to a telephone pole so that if there was any way it could make its way to fly, it would be safe until it could fly. And the wife turned to me and said, that's his mercy. That's his compassion. And, and this, this fellow said, that, that example kept coming back to me all through the week. He said, I was concerned for the sake of my conscience whether I had killed the bird or not. I really wasn't concerned about the bird. 
I can't speak for the wife, but he said the husband had compassion for that bird. And then he said, I thought of what Jesus said. That a sparrow, that, that, that the God of eternity stops what he's doing and stoops down and makes note if a sparrow falls to the ground. It's pretty amazing. And that husband gave me a picture of that. That's compassion. Reaching out to the sparrows of the world who, who maybe aren't so important, but they're wounded, they're fallen, they can't fly on their own, and, and, and somehow we shelter them and try to protect them until they can fly on their own. That's compassion. That's what, that's what would you understand? We, we have to understand how God is. That's how God looks to us. If he, if he, if he, the whole point of Jesus saying he makes note of those sparrows is he says, are ye not of more value than many sparrows? And what's the answer? Absolutely. And if God takes note that a sparrow falls and takes note to help the sparrow, wouldn't he help you and me? Doesn't he notice when we mess up? Doesn't he notice when we fall and desire to help us? Psalm 145, 8 and 9 says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. What great verses. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. Hallelujah. I'm glad that's true. And so, let's have compassion. If, 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 if He can be that compassionate with us and, and that feeling with us, we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. See? So, He's touched by that. That's how He feels about you and me. Shouldn't we feel that way with one another? How, how soon we can become uncompassionate. How soon we can become uncaring and not feel with anybody. And, and get hard-hearted. It kind of goes with that, that, that the, the word in Ephesians 4.32, be kind one to another, tender-hearted. You ever notice your heart not being so tender? And it gets hardened? And you just see situations, you see people, and you know what you do? You say, I don't care. I don't care. Hmm? That's, not, that's not the response that he's admonishing us to here. He said, be of one mind, be compassionate. And then he follows it up with be compa have compassion one of another. Then he says, love as brethren. Be loving. Love as brethren. Loving as brethren means it comes as a result of us being born into the family of God. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 9. Would you look there? And then we're going to go back to 1 John, just past 1 Peter there. But go to your left to 1 Thessalonians 4. And notice with me verse number 9, will you? 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 9. Where Paul writes this to the church of Thessalonica, he says, But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you. For ye yourselves are taught of God to do what? Love one another. You're taught of God to love one another. Jesus said, By this shall all men know you're my disciples, because ye have love one to another. He said, they're going to they're gonna understand that's you. And I'm teaching you to love one another. God is love. Now, look at 1 John chapter 2. Go past 1 Peter to 2 Peter, and then you'll see 1 John. And look at 1 John chapter 2. Notice verse number 9, where John writes this, He that saith he is in the light, and hateth his brother, is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. Notice in the light in verse 9, in the light in verse 10. It's all contrasting with being in darkness or being in light. And do you remember uh, chapter 1 and verse 7? But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have what? fellowship one with another. And by the way, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. 
Okay? He's the light. So we walk in Christ. He's saying, here we are. If you're in the light, you hate your brother. You're in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light. There's none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh, takes repeated steps in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. So God's saying, if you say you love God and yet you hate other believers, you are in darkness. I don't care what you say. That's what God says. Doesn't matter what you say. What, what, you, what you do speaks so loud I don't hear what you're saying. And that's what John's getting at. So you, you have to love your brothers and sisters in Christ or you're in darkness. Love, when we say we're going to love somebody, you know what it does? It always puts them in the best light. You know, sometimes you'll, if you have a painting or a picture you hang at your house, you, you hang it up and you think, oh, I don't think the light hits it quite right. There's a certain way you can hang a painting in an art gallery and they have lights a certain way because they want the light to hit it just right. So it looks just perfect in the right light. You know, you can always couch things. You can always phrase things. You can always get people to, and by the way, the press does it all the time. To put people in a bad light. Take a little phrase here. Take a little statement here. And just play that. And never never get the whole context to know what, it, what was being said. You know what I mean? Why? Because they want people to see it in a bad light. Let's not be that way. Love says I always want to put it in a good light. I want people to see them in a good light. And I want folks to see other believers in a good light. This is 1 Corinthians 13 where it talks about charity, the highest form of love, and, and love forbears and love forgives. Love doesn't broadcast faults or sins. Love is active, not just in word and tongue, but in deed and in truth. Jesus said, By this shall all men know you're my disciples, because ye have love one to another. No words can be much plainer than that. So, in fact, in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul writes, I could speak with the tongues of men and of angels. If I don't have charity, I'm a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. I'm meaningless. In fact, he goes on to talk about, if I give my body to be burned and I don't have charity, it profits me nothing. You see, love becomes pretty important. And, and loving others becomes the ultimate thing that, that God wants. And, he, and he's saying here, if you don't love the brethren and you don't love other believers, see, this idea that, well, I love Jesus and I love God, but I don't like going to church. That's foreign to the Bible. That's, that's not what the Bible teaches. What they're saying is, I love God, but I don't want to be around God's people. Well, if you say you love God and you hate other believers, you don't want to be around those people, then you're in darkness, my friend. And you need to get in the light. See? And you say, oh, that's pretty harsh. Well, you talk to John about it. I didn't write it. I'm just relaying the message. Okay? I'm just telling you what, what the book says. So uh, let's make sure that our, our faith is not in vain. And our, our, what we say is, is matches what we do. Okay? Let's love one another. So we want to be loving. All right? Number four. Notice back in 1 Peter chapter 3. Go back there if you would. 1 Peter 3 says, Be all of one mind, having compassion, be compassionate. Uh, love his brethren, be loving. Be pitiful. All right? Some of you say, well, I fill that one up, preacher. I'm pretty pitiful. No, that's not what I'm talking about. All right? Yeah, let's say be merciful. Okay? It's the same word as merciful, pitiful. It means, again, what we said earlier, tenderhearted. It's the same word as being soft-hearted. And especially kind to those who are, in, who are in distress or trouble. It's that inward feeling with somebody. Again, it's very close to the compassion, except this is, this is also moving you to want to do something for somebody else, especially if they're in distress. You're touched by their problems and you want to help. 
You're not, you know, John talks about how when you have the ability to help somebody and they come to you and share their need and you say, hey, I'll pray for you. Depart from me, be ye warmed and filled. And you don't give what you have to take care of the need, then, then how dwelleth the love of God in you? You see, he's saying, this is, this is the mercy says, if you need it and I have it, it's yours. It's the early church who, who uh, they, they, they had two coats, they gave one to the church and said, I can't wear two. And here, give it to somebody who doesn't have any coats. Make sure they have one. And they willingly gave that. It wasn't required. It wasn't mandatory. They just wanted to give. They wanted to be merciful. And, and so when we have the means to help then, and someone crosses our path, God may intend for us to help them. Someone said, being all fashioned of the self-same dust, let us be merciful as well as just. It was, um, I don't know if some of you saw this clip I saw on social media it was a judge in a courtroom and a man apparently had gotten a parking ticket on a certain street and he was deciding on the fine and uh, the man had his five-year-old boy with him in court and the judge calls the five-year-old boy up to the bench and he picks him up and sets him on his lap in the courtroom and he said your dad parked on such such a street now he said I can do three things one of three things I can find him ninety dollars find him no I think it was sixty dollars thirty dollars are nothing and the little five-year-old boy said thirty dollars everybody was surprised they thought for sure he'd say nothing you know and and he was and then the judge talked to him a little bit more and, and listen, you know what the judge is doing? He's being just. He's trying to deliver the penalty for the parking ticket. But he's also trying to show mercy and involve this little boy and teach him something about justice. And I think teach him that judges aren't all mean guys, you know. And uh, he ended up uh, with, and let, let that boy have a part in it. Mercy. Mercy, even though there's judgment. Again, I want you to think with me about the Good Samaritan. And you're pretty familiar with the story. I think most of us and the, the priest and the Levite came by and they went on the other side and they left the man half beaten there and bleeding. And then the Samaritan came by and he went to him. He had compassion and he went to them. The Bible says as he journeyed, he came to where he was and he saw him. And, and, and that's the first thing. That's the first thing mercy does is it sees the need. It sees that there's something that needs to be done. And then it responds inwardly with compassion. That's the inward of the, the, the mercy, I think, to relieve the distress is the outward action. The compassion is what you feel inwardly. And now you want to do something. The Bible says he went to him. And remember, he bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. He tried to help him and fix him up. And then put him on his own beast and took him to an inn and paid the man money and said, take care of him. And when I come back, if I owe you more money, I'll pay it then. And, and it cost him something. And, and, and by the way, it happened regardless of the man's race, regardless of the man's religion. Samaritans were hated. And, and listen, a Jew wouldn't help a Samaritan, but a Samaritan wouldn't help a Jew either. But that's, listen, in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, barbarian or Scythian. We're all one in Christ. There's no, uh, there, listen, there ought not to be any segregation in America, and particularly on Sunday mornings. Okay? Uh, there's, there, there ought to be one. And so uh, here was a, a, a Samaritan stopping to help a Jew. And, uh, that, uh, and so don't, don't think, that, listen, mercy helps people in need. So be merciful, even as your Father in heaven is merciful. Okay? Next we have then, he goes on to say, be courteous. 1 Peter 3.8 Be of one mind, be compassionate, be loving, be merciful, be courteous. That's simply being polite and gracious. You know what it is? It's making other people feel at home around you. 
living by what some have called the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Not, don't, it's not do unto others before they do it to you. Okay, It's do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Polite. Saying please. Saying thank you. Saying excuse me. Having respect for everyone. Not just somebody who you think can do something for you. Not just the, the, not, not just the CEO of the company, but the, the fellow who's pushing the cart around with a mop bucket on it. Being, being respectful to everyone. Being courteous. You know, it's, it's when the angels came to Abraham to say they were going to destroy Sodom. God was going to destroy Sodom. Abraham insisted he make them a meal. That's just courtesy. That's, that's courtesy of the Middle East particularly, but it was courtesy. When Sarah dies and he wants a cave to bury her in, remember the fellow said, the fellow said, here, I'll give you a cave. Hmm. And, and Abraham said, no way. I'll buy it you. I'm not, I'm not, I'll buy it to you. I'll buy it from you as a price. What is that? That's courtesy. He's, he's going to make sure that he behaves properly and does things right. That's courtesy. Someone said the toughest problem some children face is that of learning good manners without seeing any. Make sure that you're not just telling your children to have manners, but you're showing them how to have manners. A man, a man got up on the crowded bus and gave his seat to a woman. She fainted. Upon coming to, she got up and she looked at the man and said, Thank you. And that's when he fainted. All right, so uh, maybe, maybe we have a problem of not enough courtesy in the world. What do you think? So the last thing is verse 9, where he says, Not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called that ye should inherit a blessing. This is be a blessing. Now remember, all these things, be of one mind, be compassionate, be loving, be merciful, be courteous, be a blessing. Where's the context of where this is all supposed to take place? At home? Where you live? Oh, outward? Yeah, absolutely. Where you work? Absolutely. In church? Absolutely. But don't leave it there and not take it home. Make sure you live it at home. So purpose to do good. And what the purpose here is, I'm purposing to return good for evil. You don't render evil for evil or railing for railing. Don't worry, I don't get mad, I get even. Hmm? Be careful. It's easy to get down on someone else's level and go after them. I fight fire with fire. No, don't do that. Whether someone is a blessing to you or not, you can be a blessing to them. And who would be our example in that? Jesus Christ. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. Did they rail on him? They railed on him. Did he rail back? No, he did not. He did not. He blessed them. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Were any of those guys asking for forgiveness? No. Bless them anyway. If you do that, God, it says, will give you a blessing. What a promise that is. Now, the way you bless folks, obviously, is first of all with your words. You know, James chapter 3, you're in 1 Peter. Just go back to your left, would you? Right before 1 Peter is James. Look at James chapter 3 with me, will you please? James 3. And James 3, you know, is talking about our tongue. What we say. And, and, and how nobody... Verse 8 says, The tongue can no man tame. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. How I many you know how poisonous the tongue can be? Hmm? Yeah. You, ever been, you ever been poisoned by somebody's tongue? Yeah. Those wounds, the Bible says the wounds of a tail barrel go, go down deep into the innermost parts of the belly. 
They deep wounds that don't heal so fast. And notice what he says about the tongue. Therewith bless we God, verse 9, therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, Christians, save people. These things ought not so to be. How in the world can you, can you bless God in one breath and be cursing men in another breath? The same mouth, blessing and cursing. Said so that should not be. We're to be a blessing in our words. Be a blessing in what we say. There are some of you who, who to this day, you battle words that were said to you that were not a blessing, they were a cursing. And you battle those words to this day. There are others who succeed and, and who have uh, reached uh, many levels of success in your life and, and you can think about things that were said to you that encouraged you and that blessed you, that allowed you to, to move forward. You know, coaching is like that. And I think of coaches I had in sports and, and the, the, the things they said and the way they'd motivate you. I had a, a coach in my senior year at basketball and I remember, I still remember this day, running a particular play where a guy did a backdoor cut and I'm at the point guard and off the dribble, man, I, I whipped a pass like that and it went through a couple guys right to the guy and he laid it in and he stopped practice. He looked at me and said, Slayball, what type of guy are you? Who'd make a pass like that? And you know, he was just, he stopped everything to say, man, you probably couldn't do that again. And we did it again. You see? And I don't forgot that. See, there's a guy who knows how to, how to give you a blessing. And every now and then when you make a good play, he'd always look at me and say, what type of guy are you? See? I still remember that. See? And, and you, you remember those words. Mom and Dad, be careful what you say to your children. They'll remember your words. They'll remember your words. We can always say, I'm sorry. But it's like, it's like nailing all those nails into the board. You can go out and pull them all out, but the marks are still there. They don't heal so easy. You can go back to somebody and say, I'm sorry. But oftentimes the damage is done. So be careful with your words. You know... Let your words be a blessing. Like, again, context, husband and wife. When's the last time, husband, you just blessed your wife? Or you just, just said, you're sure our great mother. Or, I love how much our kids love you. Or, you're doing a fantastic job. Or, I love your smile. I'm thankful to be married to you. Or, I love to get ideas from you. Or, my, you're so creative. Or, you're so good to me, or you're so kind. Just saying things that bless other people. We're, we're, when, he, when he told Abraham, he said, I'm going to make you a great nation, and I'll bless thee, and I'll make your name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I like what it says in Zechariah 8.13. It'll come to pass that as you were a curse among the heathen, O house of Judah, and house of Israel, so will I save you and you shall be a blessing. Hey, you know why he saved you? So you can be a blessing to somebody. Be a blessing to someone. You can also bless others by what you do. You can, you can do it by buying a meal. You can do it by taking them groceries. You can do it by mowing the yard. You can do it by praying for a need they have or meeting a need they have. And actually, it's, it's, it's kind of fun to do it without them knowing it. It's fun to do it anonymously. That's the joy in doing that. Well, you don't need recognition. You know, the definition of a blessing is a benediction. It's a wish of happiness pronounced. It's a prayer imploring happiness upon another. That's why, remember when, when uh, Jacob didn't just steal the birthright from Esau, he stole the blessing. 
And remember when he found out that Jacob had been there first, Esau pleaded, said, Father, don't you have a blessing for me? Don't you have a blessing for me? He was devastated. There's no blessing left for me. And Isaac still said, come here. And he, he gave him what blessing he could. But that was, that was interesting. And, and you, you find that uh, with, Isaac, with uh, Jacob and all his kids. He, 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 he gave them a blessing. He used to do that. And, and mom and dad, give your children a blessing. There's a song. I don't know if it's in our book or not. But it's called, Make Me a Blessing. Out in the highways and byways of life, many are weary and sad. Carry the sunshine where darkness is rife, making the sorrowing glad. Make me a blessing. Make me a blessing. Out of my life, may Jesus shine. Make me a blessing, O Savior, I pray. Make me a blessing to someone today. Tell the... Tell the sweet story of Christ and His love. Tell of His power to forgive. Others will trust Him if only you prove true every moment you live. The third stanza says, Give as t'was given to you in your need. Love as the Master loved you. Be the helpless, a helper indeed. Unto your mission be true. The chorus again said, Make me a blessing. Make me a blessing out of my life. May Jesus shine. Make me a blessing, O Savior, I pray. Make me a blessing to someone today. Who you been a blessing to today? Don't, don't be that person that, you know, people hope they don't see. That when you come to church, people hope that they don't have to talk to you. Because you're going to pull them down. You're not going to be a blessing. Be the one that you look for. Everybody has somebody. Everybody has people you look forward to seeing because they're a blessing. Always lift you up. Always good. Always positive. I've had something nice to say. And you know, you find yourself looking for people like that. Don't just look for people like that. Be somebody like that. Where people will seek you out because they know that you'll be a blessing. Be of one mind. Be compassionate. Be loving, be merciful, be courteous, be a blessing. Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, take the truth now this evening, and Lord, I pray you'll help us to, to be what you desire us to be. Lord, I pray that we'll ask for your help. Lord, there's no way in our strength we'll ever be able to be these things. We need your help. So, I pray that each of us would rely upon the Holy Spirit, the one who you've given us, called alongside to help us so that we can live the way you want us to live. We can be what you desire us to be. What manner of persons ought ye to be? I pray, Lord, that each of us would be of the same mind. We'd be people of the same book. That we'd be compassionate that we'd be loving, that we'd be merciful, that we'd be courteous, that we would be a blessing to others. First of all, who we live with, and then everyone that we come in contact with, whether it's work or church or any other situation, school. But Lord, we would be a blessing. We love you. We thank you for your goodness to us. Dismiss us now with your care. Watch over us as we go our separate ways, Lord. And as that song said, uh, out of our life, may Jesus shine. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's sing the windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. 128 if you need it in your book. Here we go. The windows of heaven are open, the blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart, since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garment, he gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven, and that's why I'm happy, that's why you're happy, that's why we're happy too. God bless you. You are dismissed. Choir, come right on up.